Hey everybody and welcome back to another video from Northeast Christian Projects. Let me take my glasses off. I forgot to take them off before we started. Uh, but yeah, so um, welcome to our Monday Night Book Study. My name's Simon Williams and uh, today we are reading tactics. What we have been doing for the past uh, 19 sessions and uh, we're going to be finishing up tactics tonight. So I'm glad to have you guys uh, on here if you're on the... Uh, if you're on uh, YouTube right now, or YouTube Live, like Nick uh, McNeely, hi, hey man, how's it going? So uh, then uh, you are definitely more than welcome to be here. I really uh, am happy that you guys are here. Um, so uh, I hope you guys had a great week last week when we took a, a break. I went out to Michigan to uh, visit some family, and uh, that was a good time. My daughters got to spend some time with uh, their grandparents and also, uh, you know, their aunts and uncles and their great grandparents. They got to see them as well. So that was a good time. But, um, but I'm glad to be back in and getting into the swing of things again. Um, still trying to get a little situated here, trying to make it so that my chat is bigger, but I'm gonna have to figure that out some other time. But um, so we're on chapter 19 tactics, more sweat, less blood looking forward to getting into it and this is the last time we're going to be talking about this but this is a uh, greg coco right here he has well this is probably the last time for this book but uh he has a ministry called stand the reason check him out and you can get this book uh, to make it your own at amazon.com as well as christianbooks.com and uh, as a reminder these uh prices uh may not be accurate but the rating is pretty stable um, also, uh, this is YouTube, uh, so make sure that you like uh, the video and subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. Uh, yep, so I'm trying to get this information out to as many people as possible. So, uh, and your subscription helps, uh, sharing it also helps. All right, so, uh, looks, uh, we can jump over to the book now. Not really that much else to talk about. Um, in preparation for this, uh, the um, so uh, we're going to, after this book, we're going to take a couple weeks off again, and uh, I'll uh, be putting up uh, when the next book is going to start on the U on the YouTube channel. Uh, you'll be able to see it there. And uh, just as a reminder, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, Reasons for God by Timothy Keller. So we're going to be reading through that book, and we're going to be discussing it together. Um, if you want to get uh, that book uh, yourself uh, so that you can follow along, that'd be awesome. Um, make sure that you make these books your own. It's important. I think it's important to do that. Now, a lot of these books that we're going to be reading are books that are uh, handy to have in the library. And um, so uh, uh, Greg Kokel is going to be finishing up helping us uh, to be, be more effective in conversations. Um, and this uh, these tactics, as always, as I mentioned previously, can be used uh um, uh, by anyone in any format. Okay. So these are not like Christian tactics. These are tactics that you can use in any conversation. So, and it's important to make sure that you are asking questions and getting to know someone. So even if you're not a Christian it is still a good idea to take on this ambassador model, you know, where you're genuinely interested in the other person, you ask them questions, you analyze their reasons for why they believe a certain way, get them, um, if, analyze their position honestly see if you can detect any errors or things that you find troublesome or if you're aware of these topics uh, if you already know what the what the problem is uh, try to help them to understand why you disagree you know why is it that you disagree or why or how is it their view can be strengthened or uh, whether or not you have any confusion ask questions ask questions learn get to know who you're talking to all right, so, but jumping over to chapter 19, more sweat, less blood. So Greg Coco begins by saying, at the beginning of this book, I made a promise. Oh, excuse me. I go this way. 
At the beginning of this book, I made a promise. I said I would guide you step by step through a game plan that would help you to w help you maneuver comfortably and graciously in conversations about your Christian convictions. I wanted it, I wanted to give you the tools you needed to help make your engagements with others look more like diplomacy than D-Day. I suggested an approach I called the ambassador model. It trades on friendly curiosity rather than confrontation. Then I introduce you to a handful of effective tactics to help you navigate in conversations. I've done my best to keep my promise. Reading this book, though, does not guarantee that anything will be different in your conversations. How you proceed from here will be up to you. I want to talk now about your next steps. When I was younger, I was an Army reservist during the Vietnam era. If I were joining the military now, though, I think I would choose the Marines. Two things about the Marines impress me. The first is the motto of the U.S. Marines Corps, Semper Fi. This is uh, short for Semper Fidelis, a Latin phrase uh, that, that means always faithful. The second is a training maxim I learned from a former Marine who picked it up during, uh, during the rigors of officer candidate school. This adage is in the back of my mind every time I prepare for a public encounter with an opponent who is dedicated to defeating my convictions. The more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle. I want to end this book with some suggestions that will help you sweat more and bleed less, and thus stay always faithful to the task ahead of you. <laughs> uh, Nick McNeely says, Psst, Navy. Nick and I were both in the Navy. You know, I was going to say something about it. I'm like, the Marines, come on, man. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, uh, I guess uh, on average they see more combat than, than the Navy. But, you know, they are our child. <laughs> uh, first, uh, I would like to offer uh, eight insights I gained from a conversation I overheard while flying home from vacation one summer. Next, I want to explain the best way I know to build a small fellowship of like-minded ambassadors for Christ who value the life of the mind. Finally, I want to share with you some lessons about the importance of hostile opposition and what I learned about the courage under fire from a pair of timid door-to-door -door evangelists. Roundy, roundy makes sparky, sparky. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Nick and I were both uh, nuclear machinist mates. So we uh, provide propulsion for the ships. Using hot rock. Hot rock makes steam. Make turbine go roundy, roundy. Push boat. <laughs> All right, so Coco continues. Some eight quick tips. On a flight back uh, from uh, the Midwest, I listened while a uh, Christian brother in uh, the row directly behind me vigorously shared his faith with passengers on either side. I was glad for his effort. My wife and I were both uh, praying for him, and he made some fine points, but some of his tactics were questionable. Here are some things I learned from that experience that, make it, that might make your efforts more effective. First, be ready. The, uh, the Christian brother behind me was clearly on the alert for chances to represent Christ. Seated behind two other passengers, he had a captive audience uh, on either side for almost four hours, and he was determined to make the most of the opportunity. Though I do not need to squeeze each encounter dry, as he seemed to be doing, um, you uh, should at least uh, be willing to test the waters to see if there is any in interest. Good ambassador ambassadors are vigilant, always watchful for what might turn out to be a divine appointment. Second, keep it simple. In the in the way. Uh, uh, on the way to sharing about the cross, our Christian passenger ranged from young earth creationism to Armageddon. That is a lot to have to chew on to get to Jesus. The basic gospel is challenging enough. Generally, you will have to deal with a few obstacles that come up. But if the listener is interested, why complicate things with controversial issues unrelated to salvation? Remember, you want to put a stone in a shoe, not a rock pile. If uh, other issues don't come up, don't bring them up. Third, avoid religious language and spiritual pretense. Our dear brother was obviously a Christian. Uh, his uh, dialogue was littered with spiritual lingo and religious posturing. Every, everything about his manner seemed to fundamentalist. Even when this is genuine, it sounds weird to outsiders. Uh, words and phrases like saved, blessed, the word of God, receive Christ, and believing in Jesus as Savior and Lord may have meaning to you, but they are tired religious cliches to everyone else. As I encourage you to do in, la in the last chapter, experiment with fresh new ways to characterize the ancient message of truth. Consider using trust instead of faith. 
or follower of Jesus instead of Christian. I try to avoid quoting the Bible. Instead, I quote the words of the ancient Jewish prophets in the Old Testament, of Jesus of Nazareth, the Gospels, or of those Jesus trained to take his message after him, the rest of the New Testament. Avoid spiritual schmaltz like the plague. Even though a person is attracted to Christ, he may still be reluctant to join an enterprise that makes him look odd. Don't let your style get in the way of your message. All right, so next, focus on uh, the uh, truth of Christianity, not merely its personal benefits. I appreciated our evangelists' uh, focus on truth rather than experience. Uh, when one of our fellow passengers said he liked reincarnation, the Christian noted that, that liking reincarnation could not make it true. The facts matter. By focusing on the truth claims of Jesus instead of making a more subjective appeal, he gave his message solid foundation. Give reasons. Uh, this brother understood that making assertions without giving good reasons would be an empty effort. He was ready to give the support needed to show that his claims were not trivial. Jesus, Paul, Peter, John, and all the prophets did the same. Even in a relativistic age, people still care about reasons. Yeah, this is important. You know, like, also, when it comes to, to reasons, you know, like, it, this is why it's important to be able to have like arguments for the existence of God memorized if you find them to be good and compelling and knowing them well um, and stick to the premises. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of people talking about uh, arguments for the existence of God with people who don't know anything about arguments for the existence of God and just launch straight into the premises and conclusion and things. And that can be hard to follow for people who aren't well versed in it. Um, so when you have them memorize and understand them well, you can present them in a way that's easy to follow. You know, like uh, you can simply ask questions like uh, um, like if you think that the Kalam is a good argument, then you can ask, uh, do you, what do you, what's your take on the universe? You know, do you think that uh, it's eternal or that it began to exist? And then you can ask some questions about like uh, if you do think that it began to exist, what's your take on things beginning to exist don't you think that things that begin to exist need causes and stuff like that you know you don't have to jump into like the full-blown kalam cosmological argument in these kinds of things and especially if you jump into the arguments going into the arguments for that support the premises without being asked and things of that nature you know you can really get bogged down in the weeds really fast if uh if you start going that route you know just just ask questions like uh Greg Kokel here is saying, ask questions that have a direction, a point. Ask questions that have a point and let the other person do the talking. All right. So Kokel continues, um, stay calm. Uh, don't get mad. Don't, don't show frustration. Don't look annoyed. Keep your cool. Our friend stayed composed the entire time. The more collected he was, the more confident he seemed. The more confident he seemed, the more persuasive he sounded. If they have to go, let them leave. When you sense that the one you are talking with is looking for an exit, back off a bit. Signs of waning interest, wandering eyes, a caged look, a darting glances toward the doorway are clues that she's probably not listening anymore. Don't force the conversation. Instead, let the exchange end naturally. Remember, you don't need to close the sale in every encounter. God is in charge. He will bring the next ambassador along to pick up where you left off. When the conversation becomes a monologue, which is yours, it's time to let it go. All right, so uh, don't, uh, don't let them leave empty-handed. If possible, give the person a tangible way to follow up on what you challenged him to consider. Our friend had an arsenal of tracks, booklets, and Christian paperbacks to leave behind to keep the, process, the thinking process going. You might offer your business card, a Christian website, or, for example, www.str.org. That's Stand to Reason. You know, that's, you know, <laughs> Craig Coco's website. Um, or something to read. A uh, copy of, uh, the, of the Gospel of John is a good choice. Um, you know, like uh, people have often said, uh, chosen the gospel of john as a as a great spot and it is a great gospel to give but i'm i'm becoming more um you know like it, I, I think that the gospel of mark is under underrated i think that uh, the gospel of mark would be a great place to start somebody on you know it's like an abridged version or you know like it's a bridge version of matthew 
and it, it's the shortest book. Um, it gets straight to the point. You know, it, it, I think that the Gospel of Mark is underrated. Um, but, you know, uh, people don't just print out the Gospel of Mark very often. Most of the time you'll see just the Gospel of John printed out. So that might be hard to find. But anyway, um, it's small, inexpensive, and focuses on Christ. Uh, offer it as a gift, uh, suggesting it, it might be best for me to let Jesus speak for himself. Uh, these eight ideas remove obstacles that get in your way as an ambassador. They will make it easier for others to focus on your message without being distracted by your methods. The irony is that when our method is skillful, it fades into the background. But when our method is clumsy and offensive, then it becomes the focus instead of the truth we have to communicate. Dry Tinder. Another key to making you a better ambassador is the company you keep. You may have found that this book has opened up a whole new spiritual landscape you've, you're anxious to explore. This can be exhilarating, but it can also be frustrating if your Christian friends have not experienced the same epiphany. There is a solution, though. A while back, I spent most of uh, one day with uh, seven seemingly ordinary women who uh, captured my attention, respect, and admiration. They were not philosophers, theologians, authors, or captains of industry. They were mostly mothers and housewives uh, juggling care, uh, carpools, laundry, and tired husbands. Every couple of weeks, they uh, gathered together with their Bibles uh, and study materials in a small group simply known as Women's of Berea. Women of Berea. Uh, their main purpose was not prayer or fellowship, uh, though both of those things happened. Rather, their goal was to study and dis and their goal was study and discussion, engaging their minds in careful thinking on things that mattered. When uh, people ask me how to get their Christian and their their church interested in loving God with all, with their minds as Christians, I have a simple bit of advice that these women understood. You can't start a fire with wet wood. You must begin with dry tinder. In nearly every church, there are brothers and sisters who share your hunger but have yet to share your discovery. They are dissatisfied, yearning for something more substantial, but do not know where to turn. These people are your dry tinder. Do not make it your goal to change your church just yet. First, find people with uh, of kindred spirit. Uh, gather up the dried kinder, plant your spark, and uh, kindle the flame. Aim uh, to start a modest fire with a cluster of believers who value using their minds in their pursuit of God. Once the fire gets uh, ignited, don't be surprised if uh, some of the wet wood around you begins to dry out and starts to blaze. Commit to meeting uh, together right on, on a regular basis, weekly, biweekly, monthly, whatever fits your schedule. Individual committee, uh, commitments uh, to your group may be short-term for a particular study project or part of a long-term relationship similar to C.S. Lewis's friendships with J.R.R. Tolkien and others in a group they called the Inklings. It's up to you. Yeah, so this is a big uh, thing that I'm actually trying to do with Northeast Christian Apologetics. You know, like trying to go to churches, find the dry tender, meet with them weekly discussing apologetics and presenting this kind of material to them. And then I'm hoping that uh, they will, th this small fire will bring in more people, you know? Um, and, and so like, I, I, uh, I'm hoping that this it will help New England area and will bring in more churches, but we'll just see, you know, we're, we're still having to see, I have uh, discovered that um, while doing this, uh, that uh, the the groups usually start off actually fairly large, and then they dwindle down to just a few, the people who are able to persevere, you know? Um, and so I, the apologetics is not easy. <laughs> so it does take a small group— it, it, a group of dedicated people in order to really understand the, f the philosophy involved with this. Um, so I'm just trying to persevere in it. And if you're of a similar situation, I think that you should just persevere as well. You know, just to keep uh, uh, studying this kind of stuff and finding, continuing to find people who are like-minded, um, who are interested in loving God with all their minds, who are uh, not afraid to look at uh, alternative religions, uh, alternative uh, perspectives, and things of that nature, nature who have uh, matured in their faith and are able to um, 
effectively analyze uh, the Bible and uh, uh, natural theology and things of that nature. All right, so uh, Coco continues. Um, Culture is not profoundly changed, uh, Chuck Colson said, not by the effort of huge institutions, but of individual people. Our correction, culture is most profoundly changed, not by the efforts of huge institutions, uh, but of individual people. Uh, Edmund Burke called them little platoons, small groups of ordinary folks making a difference where their feet hit the sidewalk. Meet together for a limited but a definite period of time to study a particular topic. As a group, you might listen to recorded talks, discuss a book, or assess a video you discovered online. You might role play differences of opinion using the tactics you've learned from this book. Or you might work together to construct an intelligent, reasoned response to the points you heard on a talk show or saw in a letter to the editor. Uh, encourage each other to step out of your comfort zone and apply what you've learned, what you're learning. Your group could become a catalyst influencing others in your church, a vital resource that your Christian friends can turn to when they have questions. The women of Berea soon began to have an impact beyond their own ranks, drying out the wet wood around them by being good ambassadors for Christ. The key to effectiveness outside your group is to stay visible. Be committed to excellence and keep a good attitude. This is not a time for high-mindedness or uh, but for usefulness. Yeah, you don't want to silo. <laughs> this is something that is is terrible uh, for Christians and uh, uh, for people who do these kinds of things. You know, you don't want to meet secretly or be exclusive. You know, like you, you want to make it so that you're warm and welcoming um, and engaged and visible and uh, invite people, you know. Um, yeah. Important stuff. All right, so Coco continues. Uh, Remember, look for the dry tender, uh, like-minded people of kindred spirit. There are more of them around you than you think. Uh, you just have to find them. You could be the match that kindles the kind uh, the tinder that starts a bonfire of excitement in your church. You just need to be willing to take the initiative to lead others to the pursuit of thoughtful, intelligent convictions. Hostile witnesses. Part of that pursuit involves a certain kind of vulnerability. None of us wants our views proven wrong, especially our most cherished ideas, regardless of which side of the fence we're on. But if we want to cultivate a well-informed faith, we need to be aware of our own powerful instincts for ideological self-preservation. This instinct is so strong that sometimes we are tempted to, into, to intellectually circle the wagons and guard against the slightest challenge to our beliefs. The strategy proves a false sen provides a false sense of security, however. The opposite approach offers much more safety. Instead of digging in behind fortifications to protect against uh, attackers, we should encourage critique by hostile witnesses. In academic circles, this is called peer review. Philosophers, scientists, and theologians present their ideas in professional forums and solicit critique. They, they test the merit of their thoughts by offering them to people who are inclined to disagree. A number of years ago, I attended a three-day conference titled Design and its Critics. The best minds in the intelligent design movement were assembled to make their case, but they were not alone. They had invited the top Darwin Darwinian thinkers in the country to listen to their ideas and take their best shots. It was one of the most invigorating and intellectually honest encounters I have ever witnessed. Peer review is based on a sound notion of our if our ideas are easily destroyed by those acquainted with the facts, they ought to be discarded. But if our ideas are good, they will not be upended so easily. In the process, we will learn what the other side knows. We may even be surprised at uh, how weak the, subs uh, the substance of the resistance really is. Yeah, th this this is something that I've learned. You know, um, uh, it's very easy to become very defensive and we need to not be defensive you know even if somebody's being hostile and that can be very difficult um it's a mark of maturity um in order to uh display self-control and patience in those kinds of uh, situations um it's a mark of humility to recognize that you may not you may you're not always right you know you you're not always right um and you may be wrong on things. And if we're dealing with uh, situations in which uh, we're talking about eternal significance here, 
then it's important to take these matters seriously. You know, you, you need to genuinely analyze the arguments of um, Muslims, for example. You know, why is it that they believe what they believe? Do they? What's the evidence for their claims? You know, wh why should it be preferred over Christianity? Are there any reasons to prefer Islam over Christianity? You know, so this is a... Uh, these kinds of things are important, you know. Um, so, uh, I have grown significantly in my faith and in my knowledge of Christianity by uh, listening to and patiently analyzing the arguments from non-Christians. Okay, they have sharpened. They have helped me drastically sharpen my theology and my understanding of uh, various topics, including Christian topics. So. Instead of uh, this, instead of uh, pursuing this endeavor, um, being uh, being afraid to pursue this endeavor in fear of like losing your salvation, it can be a way of uh, making it better. Um, after all, if what you believe is wrong and it has eternal significance, then you should look into it. You know that's that's important. That is important. All right. So uh, con uh, Coco continues. Uh, the lesson of hostile witnesses has driven home to me uh, quite unexpectedly one day while sitting in my library prepping for a radio show. I, I heard a knock on my front door. When I answered, two middle-aged women smiled at me pleasantly, bundles of apocalyptic literature in hand. They asked uh, if I wanted to see their ma material. There were uh, two at the door, but only one in front. The one who had knocked spoke. Uh, the... The second uh, stood quietly in the back watching. Jehovah's Witnesses go out in pairs, usually one experienced witness and one newer disciple. Uh, the, uh, the neophyte uh, makes the uh, initial contact, while the uh, mentor waits uh, protectively in the background, ready for a flanking maneuver if the young can uh, young cadet gets into trouble. I knew this encounter would be brief. First, I had little time to make an impact because I had to leave for the radio studio. Second, door-to-door -door missionaries like these usually have little time for anyone who is biblically literate. I knew that once I showed my hand, they would disappear quickly and look for an easier mark. I Still, still I didn't want to send my visitors away empty-handed. Yeah, this has happened to me a number of times, actually, where Jehovah's Witnesses have come to my door, and, uh, you know, I'm, like, ready to talk to them, and but uh, they recognize that uh, I have um, some biblical competence, and so they just leave. You know, they, they're just like, we're, we're, they'll say over their uh, <laughs> shoulder, yeah, we're Jehovah's Witnesses, and just walk away. I'm like, no, come back. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's see what Coco says. Um, I'm a, I'm, I am a Christian, I began. I directed my uh, comments uh, to the younger convert, uh, the one less influenced by the Watchtower organization, and hopefully more open to another viewpoint. It's uh, clear we have some differences, including the vital issue of the identity of Jesus. I believe what John teaches in John 1, 3, that uh, Jesus is the uncreated creator. This would make him God. Uh, mention of the deity of Christ was all that was needed to bring the rear guard into action. The woman in the shadow spoke up uh, for the first time. I honestly wasn't prepared for her response. You're entitled to your opinion, and we're entitled to ours, and all was all she said. No question, no challenge, no theological rebuttal. This was a dismissal, not a response. She turned on her heel and started for the next house, trainee in tow, in, in search of more vulnerable game. I cast about for something to say that might slow their retreat. You're also entitled to be wrong in your opinion. I, bl <laughs> I blurted out, but uh, the retort had no effect. I admit it was a poor response, uh, but it was all I could think of at the moment. Clearly, we both can't be right, I added, uh, trying to mend the breach, even though we're both entitled to our opinions. I was hoping for some kind of reaction, some kind of engagement, but my challenge went unanswered. As they marched down the walkway, I fired my final salvo, vainly hoping for a response. Obviously, you're not interested in hearing an, any other uh, point of view than your own. Then they were gone. Gunshy. Uh, in the moments that followed, a host of questions flooded my mind. Did I use the right approach? Apparently not. Would a different tack have been more effective? Probably. Did anything I say leave a good impression? Unlikely. Did I plant even a seed of doubt or stimulate any reflection in their minds? Hard to say. 
I will probably never know the full answer to those questions, but the meeting was still educational. Notice a couple of things about this short exchange. What did these two missionaries do when they encountered someone who was biblically literate? What was their first response when I mentioned my background? And then gave a thumbnail sketch of an argument uh, striking, uh, striking at the heart of their most cherished doctrine. They backed off. They bailed out. They ran away. What's wrong with this picture? If you're convinced that the medicine you held in your hand would save the life of a dying patient, would you turn away and let him perish because he did not like the taste of the treatment? In the same way, isn't it strange that a door-to-door evangelist commissioned to save the world would take flight at the first sign of opposition? These Jehovah Witnesses, Witness missionaries were in a battle for human souls, yet they fled at the first sound of gunfire. This encounter taught me three things about these missionaries that were also lessons for me. First, they were not confident in their message. Why should I take a single moment to consider their alleged message from God if the messenger herself would not lift one finger to defend it? Why should I respect the cause of a soldier who retreats at the first sign of resistance? Second, these missionaries could not have been interested in my salvation. If they were genuinely concerned about rescuing my lost soul, their first impulse would have been to find out what I thought and why the first two steps of our own game plan, then attempt to correct what they consider to be my dangerous errant theology. Isn't that why they go door to door, to witness to the lost, to give uh, them the truth about God as they understood it? Yet they didn't even listen to my point of view, much less try to correct my error. That tells me they didn't care much about my eternal destiny. Third, they did not take the issue of truth seriously. Religious evangelism is a persuasive enterprise. The evangelist thinks her view is true and opposing views are false. She also thinks the difference, the difference matters, which is why she's trying to change other people's minds. Follow the truth, you win. Follow a lie, you lose. Big, big time. A commitment to truth as opposed to a commitment to an organization means an openness to refining one's own views. It means increasing the accuracy of one's understanding and being open to cor- correction in thinking. A challenger might uh, turn out to be a blessing in, dis- in disguise, an ally instead of an enemy. An evangelist who is uh, convinced in her view then should be willing to engage the best arguments against it. One of two things would then happen. She might discover that some objections to her view are good ones. The rebuttal would uh, help her make adjustments and cor- corrections in her thinking, refining her knowledge of the truth. Or it might uh, turn out that she is on solid ground after all. Developing answers to the toughest arguments uh, against her position would strengthen her, uh, strengthen both her witness and, and her confidence in her convictions. Yeah, so uh, this is an interesting thing about the Jehovah's Witness because uh, their their salvation is wrapped up in um, their missionary work, their door to door work, you know. So, um, and what and what Coco here is uh, showing is that that is a, a less effective way of doing missionary work than for Christians. Then Christianity, we are told to make disciples. It's a direction from from Jesus, but it doesn't impact our salvation if we fail to make disciples or if we fail to do evangelism. You know, like our salvation is uh, uh, by uh, the grace of God. You know, it's not by works. So whereas uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness is a works-based kind of deal. So, and it actually ends up being less effective. You know, it it makes uh, their evangelism less compelling, you know, because it is this aloof kind of like, oh, well, I've done my job. I've knocked on this door and now I'm out of here, you know, whereas uh, cr- uh, Christians who aren't uh, compelled to in or in in a fear of losing their salvation can uh, don't have to do that. You know, um, Nick Mendeley says, uh, have you found any good objections uh, to your uh, views in these discussions? Uh, if you did, uh, if or correction, I'm sorry. Uh, if yes, how, how did you han- uh, handle that situation? Have you found any good objections to your views in these discussions? In discussions with, uh, with Jehovah's Witness or discussions uh, in general? So you, you have to be more specific. When, when I've uh, encountered Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, they kind of just left. You know, I didn't have much time to talk about them. They, they did what, what happened here, you know, um, 
I greeted them. I mentioned that uh, I was a Christian, and then they just turned and left. You know, so, but, uh, but I have a good, uh, found good objections and other things, you know, and I've often had to change my perspective on things uh, based off of uh, having um, uh, read or analyzed good objections. Um, and, and this has to deal with, like, my encounters with uh, the Kalam cosmological argument or the uh, uh, Leibnizian cosmological argument dealing with uh, the second premise and also the first premise of the Kalam in particular and the first premise of uh, the Leibnizian cosmological argument. Um, you know, like, uh, uh, with regard to um, um, the second premise of the Kalam, you know, I, I personally am of the mindset that uh, we can't know whether or not the universe had a beginning of its existence, especially if uh, B theory of time is uh, uh, the theory of time that most corresponds to how time is constituted in the physical reality. You know, we could never know if uh, the universe is co-eternal with God or if God created it, even if it has a, 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 even if we discover that it has a finite number of uh, earlier than temporal coordinates or an infinite number. Either way, it's irrelevant. You know, it doesn't matter if uh, the temporal coordinates in the physical reality are finite or infinite. It could still have been created or not created. We can never know. And that was brought to my attention uh, through through uh, reflection and also through objections uh, that are presented by by non-Christians. Um, and you already know uh, with my you know, I've, I have have videos about it, uh, you know, dealing with God's omniscience. I think that Patrick Grimm's objection is really good. And so, like, the typical formulation of uh, how you define, how, uh, you know, theologians define and even philosophers define um, omniscience, where it's talking about the all, all propositions, I, I think that uh, Patrick Grimm is, uh, has provided a good way of uh, defeating that definition um, and things like that. You know, uh, there are definitely a lot of objections out there um, uh, that I've found uh, to be good. Good objections that have caused me to rethink my position. That, that happens a lot, <laughs> you know. So anyway, um, so uh, Greg Coco continues, Courage Under Fire. Here is uh, the main takeaway for you. Uh, don't retreat uh, simply because you face opposition. Uh, too much is at stake. Um, be uh, the kind of soldier who instills respect in others because of your courage under fire. Make your case in, uh, in the presence of hostile witnesses. Throw your gauntlet into the arena and see uh, what the other side has to say. It's one of the most effective ways to establish your case and to help you cultivate a bulletproof faith over time. Uh, do not lose heart if it, your audience seems to get the best of you sometimes. That happens to each of us uh, sooner or later. There is an easy explanation for why we sometimes feel ill-treated or ignored. A simple reason why the scoreboard often reads, Lions 10, Christians 0. Uh, Jesus warned us in advance, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Matthew 10, 24 through 25. This is how our Savior is uh, treated. Uh, this is what uh, he said our lot would be. Uh, we should never expect a fair shake, uh, a shake or wine when it isn't given. We are not to, to play the victim. This is, a dis, uh, this is disloyalty to Christ. Os Guinness writes, uh, followers of Christ uh, flinch at times from the pain of wounds and the smart of slights. But the cost is in the contract of uh, the way of the cross. No child of a sovereign God whom we call our Father is ever a victim or in a minority. This is why Jesus uh, finished his uh, comments with, uh, Do not fear them, uh, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and, and hidden that will not be known. Listen carefully to those words. Do not fear. He repeats them three times. Jesus is with us, and he promised a final day of reckoning, as I heard someone once say. There is a justice, and one day they shall feel it. But even this ultimate victory should not be our immediate concern. If you want to know how I fight off discouragement, 
consider these words of former U.S. Ambassador Alan Keyes that uh, for many years were posted in my study. It is not for us to calculate our victory or fear our defeat, but, it, but to do our duty and leave the rest in God's hands. Yeah, it's a, this is important to understand, you know. Like uh, we are to plant and water, plant seeds and water, but God is the one who produces the growth, you know. Uh, we we need to really trust God in these encounters. You know, it's a really important. And even when you don't understand something, you know, um, take it on board. Uh, d- d- don't be afraid to be like, okay, I haven't heard I haven't heard that objection. That's an interesting point of view you have there. Um, uh, I'll have to consider it later. You know, this uh, going back to Nick McNeely's question or yeah, question. You know, like when. Uh, this has happened to me with regard to a lot of things, like I said, but in particular, one st- stands out is uh, when we were when I was talking with a non-Christian about uh, the uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Um, we were talking about um, uh, we were talking about hypotheses for the resurrection of Jesus, non-Christian ones, uh, and uh, he brought up uh, the cognitive dissonance. Uh, uh, view, where uh, it was cognit- that the disciples were experiencing cognitive dissonance after the uh, execution of Jesus, and uh, key members had um, hallucinations, and uh, their conviction. Uh, these hallucinations caused these caused these key members, like Simon Peter, to uh, uh, to firmly believe that Jesus had been resurrected. Perhaps Simon Peter, perhaps John. People who are the core of Jesus' group, and then through their conviction, um, convince the other disciples as well that Jesus actually did raise from the dead, and that uh, the uh, the appearances as described in the Gospels are kind of legendary. Um, I have in the past dismissed this uh, hypothesis as too complicated and uh, just kind of ridiculous, but um, after talking with this person more and more, you know, I've actually come to uh, view it as a plausible, is probably the most plausible naturalistic explanation that you can find. Whether or not it's more plausible than the resurrection is disputable, you know, but uh, I, I still think that the resurrection hypothesis is more plausible. But uh, even if but help me to understand that uh, some some uh, people will be able to see that these uh, naturalistic explanations are plausible. Um, and uh, they personally would be con- con- convinced that it's more plausible than the resurrection hypothesis, and therefore it should be pre- preferred. But this uh, analysis, this conversation has helped me to understand that even if— even if a naturalistic uh, hypothesis is plausible or even more plausible than the resurrection hypothesis, does that instantly mean it ought to be preferred? Because what we're dealing with, when we're saying that's plausible, that means that we still don't know. We don't know if that's true. Just because this naturalistic explanation is plausible, that doesn't automatically mean that it's true. So should it be preferred? And that's why I've been saying, like in the past and all these times, we need to also take into consideration pragmatic considerations. We need to consider pragmatic justifications. You know, we're talking about eternal consequences here, and this needs to be taken into consideration. All right. All right. So, um, uh, but yeah, yeah, like these things are important. All right. So Coco continues. Uh, study these tactics and learn how. Oh, correction. I'm sorry. Um, impact. Uh, oh, correction. Okay. So, as ambassadors, we're at the top of the page. As ambassadors, we measure our legitimacy by faithfulness and obedience to Christ, who alone will bring the increase. The most important gauge of our success will not uh, will be not our numbers or even our impact, but fidelity to our Savior. That opportunity for faithfulness might be a salesman on the front door or a chance encounter at the bank, a casual conversation on an airplane, or a chat with a waitress in a restaurant. It could be any place, any time. If you apply the right tactics with God's help, a lost and confused person will see not only the problem, his own rebellion, but also the solution, Jesus Christ. The question you need to answer is, in advance is when God opens that door, will I be ready? 
Study these tactics and learn how they can help you in various situations. They will serve you well when you need them, if you put them into practice. Remember, if you, do, if you don't do it, it doesn't work. Know the truth. Know your Bible well enough to give an ad- accurate answer. Tactics are not a substitute for knowledge. Cleverness without truth is manipulation. Push yourself be- beyond your comfort zone. Begin to mix it up with others before you feel adequately prepared. You'll, you'll learn best by putting your tactics into play. Even though you may falter a bit at first, that is part of the learning process. Along the way, you'll discover what the other side has to offer, uh, what, uh, what, <laughs> which often is not very much. Hello, Sasha! All right, so Coco continues, uh, do not be discouraged by outward appearances. Don't get caught in the trap of trying to assess the effectiveness of your conversations by their immediate visible results. Even though a person rejects what you say, you may have to put a stone in a shoe. These things take time. Remember, the harvest is often a season away. Finally, live out the virtues of a good ambassador. Represent Christ in a winsome and attractive way. You, God's representative, are the key to making a difference uh, for the kingdom. Show the world that Christianity is worth thinking about. With God's help, go out and give them heaven. You know, so um, here's the ambassador's creed. An ambassador is ready, so you're ready. An ambassador is alert for chances to represent Christ and will not back away from a challenge or an opportunity. Patient. An ambassador won't quarrel, but will listen in order to understand. Then with gentleness, will seek to respectfully engage those who disagree. Reasonable. An ambassador has informed convictions, not just feelings. Gives reasons, asks questions, aggressively seeks answers, and will not be stumped by the same challenge twice. Yeah, remember when you are presented with uh, something that you really have to think about, say... I appreciate the insight and I have to think about that. And then you have to think about it. (laughs) You have to seek answers. You know, it's really important to ask questions, but it's even more important to seek answers. You know, a lot of people will find questions, get stumped by them and just abandon everything. You know, questions are not good enough. We need something. uh, We need a reason. We can't just, especially when we're doing worldview analysis, you can't eject, just reject worldviews. You reject one worldview and hold another. You always hold a particular worldview. Whatever your worldview is, you have to have, you have a worldview, even if you don't know what it is. So people need to be analyzing what they believe, how the world is constituted, you know, and why should I prefer this worldview over another one? It's not enough to just say I reject Christianity. What are you replacing it with? You know, why, and why is that to be preferred over Christianity? All right, so tactical. An ambassador adapts to each unique person and situation, maneuvering with wisdom to challenge bad thinking, presenting the truth in an understandable and compelling way. Clear. An ambassador is careful with language and will not rely on Christian lingo nor gain unfair advantage by resorting to empty rhetoric. Fair. An ambassador is sympathetic and and understanding towards others and will acknowledge the merits of contrary views. Honest. An ambassador is careful with the facts and will not misrepresent others' view, overstate his own case, or understate the demands of the gospel. Humble. An ambassador is provisional in his claims, knowing that his his understanding of truth is fallible. He will not press a point beyond his justification beyond what his justification allows. Attractive. An ambassador will act with grace, kindness, and good manners. He will not dishonor Christ in his conduct. Dependent. An ambassador knows that effectiveness requires joining, joining his best efforts with God's power. All right. So these are really important. You know, I think, I personally think these are really important. So I'm just going to highlight that. So making sure that you're ready, patient, reasonable, tactical, clear, fair, honest, humble, attractive, and dependent. Okay? This is important. And that's it! 
And that's it. We have finished the book tactics. Thank you for being with me, everyone. I really appreciate it. Time to celebrate. Yeah. All right. Good job, guys. Good job. Thank you for coming out and uh, being with me for tactics. It's been a long time, <laughs> 19 chapters, but uh, we, uh, we did that together, you know? We did the chapters together, and uh, I appreciate you guys coming out and visiting me or being with me through it. You know, it's been a long trek. It's been a long trek. This is uh, book number two that we have under our belt. Book number two. Um, and, yeah, I think it was a really good read. I think Tactics is a, a must-read for, uh, for Christians in particular, but anybody— Anybody, I think this is uh, really good. I think that it would improve uh, society a lot if people actually did take on the ambassador model. Uh, those those things are very uh, are very good. You know, patience, self control, knowledge, not straw manning people, <laughs> not uh, um, hitting people with the insults. Uh, just uh, just straight up. Uh, genuine curiosity, seeking out reasons and understanding, you know, that is good stuff, no matter who you are. All right. So just as a reminder, our next book, Timothy Keller, The Reasons for God, that's going to be up next. And I'll let you guys know when we start uh, next week, my brother is uh, getting married. So I will not be in town. I'm going to be out in New Jersey and uh, preparing for that wedding. It's going to be a good time. Uh, Nick Mendeley asked, uh, do I have diplomatic immunity now? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> uh, all right. So All right, so let's go back to face only. Okay, so we are... Uh, uh, all right, so thanks for coming out with me, guys. I really appreciate you uh, helping me finish this book together. Um, I Keep an eye out for uh, uh, for the update on uh, Northeast Christian Projects. Uh, uh, Facebook page, or not Facebook, well, yeah, the Facebook page as well as the YouTube channel. I'm going to be uh, presenting... Uh, or make signing up. I don't even know what that's called, but uh, preparing a uh, <laughs> the uh, the thing. But uh, let's uh, go ahead and celebrate one more time. Kaboom! Yeah! We finished the book, and this is going to be uh, the last time you see this uh, this overlay. Uh, but it was good. I've uh, really enjoyed our time together in this book. So uh, please uh, uh, make sure that uh, you like and subscribe uh, and share the content. And uh, I'll see you next time. All right. Thank you and God bless. Hey, before you go, I hope you enjoyed today's enlightening discussion during our Christian Apologetics book study. It's always a blessing to come together to explore our faith and grow in our understanding. Your participation means the world to me, and I'm grateful for your continued support of Northeast Christian Apologetics. Remember, you can stay connected with me and access valuable resources by visiting my website, at nechristianapologetics.com. There you'll find a wealth of articles, videos, and recommended reading material to deepen your knowledge of Christian apologetics. If you're as passionate as I am about equipping believers to defend their faith and engage in meaningful conversations, you can also support this ministry in various ways. One way to support this work is through patreon.com. By becoming a patron, you'll have access to exclusive content, early access to our discussions, and a chance to connect with like-minded individuals who share your passion for Christian apologetics. If Patreon is not your style, some people prefer to give me a one-time tip. And if you'd like to do that, then feel free to do so through Venmo or Cash App. But of course, there are many ways to support me. By praying for this ministry, sharing the content on social media, or simply spreading the word about what I do. Every bit of support goes a long way in helping me fulfill my mission. Once again, thank you for joining me today. Your presence and engagement enrich these discussions, and together we're on a journey to strengthen our faith and share the good news with others. Stay tuned for more exciting book studies, thought-provoking discussions, and opportunities to grow your Christian apologetics journey. I look forward to seeing you again.